I wanted to, to point out to all of you that in your, um, your visit day packets, you have a handout of speaker biographies. So I didn't go over their extensive qualifications this morning. You have those all here in the handouts for everyone that, that you met last night and um, we'll hear from today as well. So now, um, let's see. Um, Professor Sidhu, do you want to come up and, and start setting up? Uh, what we have next is the uh, Solyndra case discussion. Um, you also have that in your packets. I hope you all had a chance to, to read those in advance. You can pull those out. And um, we, this will give you a little bit of a flavor of what it's like to be in a case discussion in the engineering leadership class. And um, at this point, too, I wanted to point out we don't have um, a lot of breaks this morning. We're going to go straight through until lunch at around noon. So if you need to sneak out to the, the restrooms, please don't hesitate to do, do so. They're um, down this hallway here and on your left. Um, I also wanted to introduce someone else who's in the room today from the Fung Institute. Cindy Chien is um, back there. Cindy is a program manager with the Fung Institute, and she is specifically working on the capstone project. So she is soliciting capstone projects from faculty and industry. So she'll be a great resource for you starting today and, and throughout the summer. Cindy and I um, are here to help you um, work on, on choosing capstones and understanding a little bit more about what your choices are. So she'll be around specifically at lunchtime, um, especially at lunch and at your breaks, um, to help you out with that. OK, thanks very much. Welcome to Berkeley, for those of you that haven't been here before. I mean, other than last night, of course. Um, so it's very hard to give a complete overview in just a few minutes. And Professor Spanos from WECS is also breathing down my neck. So I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. I think all of you have read about the details of some of the elements of the program. But let me just start to step through some of the, some of the details. So. Um, Berkeley ME is a very strong program. Uh, the areas in the MEng um, degree program that we are offering at this point, and there will probably be some more in the future, but uh, for the moment, these are kind of a strong set. Sustainable engineering, which covers a broad range of, of well, you're going to see some pictures in a minute, so I won't tell you what it covers. Uh, experiential advanced control system design, which is a, a long word for kind of mechatronics and, um, and lab-based design technology. Advanced energy technology, so mechanical engineering and its subjects play a very strong role in most energy technology because there's either conversion or there's generation or there's storage, and most of these things involve substantial elements of mechanical engineering. And finally, computational manufacturing. So if you're looking around at what's happening, if you look at the back of your iPod or your, your iPhone, it says designed in California and produced in China. And most of that is done because the design work and sort of the manufacturing organization of the integration of the different pieces is done electronically in California, and then it's manufactured in China. So that may not be the best example right now with all the trouble that Apple's having with Foxconn, but the fact of the matter is if you think about 787s or iPhones or robotic devices or even laying out manufacturing facilities, a lot of it is done computationally. So let me give you a couple of snapshots of some of these areas. So overview of mechanical engineering. Uh, it's sort of it's not your father's or your grandfather's mechanical engineering, like the old Buick ad used to say. There's elements of, of uh, bioengineering, biotechnology, healthcare, energy, information technology, transportation, hardcore manufacturing. So we do pretty much everything in manufacturing that isn't done with semiconductors, which happens in electrical engineering and computer science. But there are areas of crossover, like MEMS, et cetera. And of course, the core disciplines. And then if you think about where is it? There we go. Whoops. If you think about what's really kind of pulling everything together these days, and this is something that many of us, myself personally, are, are heavily engaged in, the concept of being able to go through the entire product design, use, and uh, end of life phase and do it in a way which has a limited uh, impact on the environment, has limited social impact, in fact, has social benefits, but also is a, a good business proposition. So most of the things that are going on, and you'll see this pervading many, many uh, different programs in the MEng um, suite of offerings from the different departments, is getting back to sustainability, green engineering, green design, all the way from raw materials to manufacturing, how you distribute and how you use, and finally how you recover or reuse these kinds of things. So there's a flavor of that in all of these different subcategories of ME, but that's not what drives them all. But of course, sustainable engineering, it is, a, it is the primary uh, goal of that. 
So um, here's an example of sort of combining sustainable engineering and computational manufacturing. This, is, this wasn't one of the capstone projects, but it may be a capstone this time around. We have a project funded by the Department of Energy on artificial photosynthesis, going from solar to fuel through uh, a nanoscale uh, interaction between photons of light and catalysts in small uh, rods, and those rods have to be manufactured, and then more importantly, they have to be designed in such a way that the, as the light is incident on these rods, it can be reflected and absorbed substantially, and that causes the breakdown of, of water into hydrogen and oxygen, and that can then be recombined into other things to make a fuel. So you have this kind of photosynthesis process, but done with entirely mechanical and chemical, chemical means. So there's a lot of opportunity for system scale, for small scale, large scale. In fact, this diagram is to show that it goes all the way from the nano scale up to the kilometer scale if you try to do this in a large, uh, in a large process. The controls area, the example that was actually from the capstone project that was used this year was, was uh, supported by or collaborated with applied materials and Intel. And it had a lot to do with trying to connect the control of robotic devices that are used for material handling and semiconductor fabrication, and essentially come up with a simulation environment that allows mechanical and control engineers to be able to pick up, manipulate, position, and access and process uh, with very high degree of accuracy and re repeatability the uh, uh, materials that are flowing through a semiconductor fab. And as you know, these uh, semiconductor fabs are very highly very highly organized, very highly cost-effectively optimized because every second, every, every ounce of, or, or, or a, a gram of material is very expensive. And this is something that mechanical engineers do in terms of assisting in the operation, smooth operation. And this was one of our capstone projects this year. The last area, uh, advanced energy technology uh, of the four in mechanical engineering, this is something run by Professor Van Carey, and he's looking at Capstone Project, actually was looking at how you model the use of energy in data centers. So everybody thinks the cloud is wonderful, but eventually someplace in the cloud, there's a room that's packed with servers generating incredible amounts of heat. I mean, Google is building a server farm uh, off the coast of Sweden, I think, or on the coast of Sweden, so they can draw in Arctic cooled water and use that to cool the thing, because the footprint, the carbon footprint of these things is, is, is humongous. So everybody thinks, well, I don't have an office, I'm not driving to my office, I'm using the cloud, but in fact, somewhere there's a carbon footprint that's blowing up in the background. So Van Carey and, and the students in this group were trying to, to figure out a way to, first of all, organize this in such a way that you could take advantage of, of different kinds of cooling and different kinds of energy uh, storage, how to essentially make sure that when you manufacture these systems all the way from the manufacturing, delivery, and end of life that you have a very small carbon footprint. And it's a way to address sort of sustainability and advanced energy technologies. You get a sort of a bigger processing bang for the, for the environmental buck when you look at these, at these, uh, at these areas. And I think, I think that's, that's the end of it. Next we have Costas Fanas, and he's the professor and chair of the Optical Engineering and Computer Science Department. Okay. Um, great. Well, welcome. Glad to have you here. I'm here to represent the Department of ECS. I'm here with uh, Professor David Kaller, who is uh, somewhere in the back, I hope. Uh, he's uh, the associate chair of the department the Depar and the chair of the Computer Science Division. What uh, I would like to, to tell you today is to answer the question, primarily in a few minutes, which is quite challenging, as to why you want to come here for the Masters of Engineering. And first I have to figure out how to advance the slides here. Which, uh, oh, here it is, I can, okay. So the first reason is, the first reason is psychic. It's not technical. Berkeley is a wonderful place. And maybe you have uh, guessed that already, maybe you have, been here, you have been here before. But those of us who come here to work never leave, more or less. So. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good place to be in many ways. Now, not only the geography is good, but the intellectual, intellectual environment is good. Uh, I have to tell you that when you come for a degree, uh, it is quite important to be in a good department, to be in a good uh, program, to work with good, good, good faculty, but it's also very important to be in a good environment that is larger than the department that you are. 
And Berkeley certainly provides uh, that uh, opportunity to expand. Focusing a little bit on my department, it has been around for a long time, had changed names a few times. Uh, it, uh, it became a department of electrical engineering in the 50s. Uh, it became a, it uh, became a department of electrical engineering and computer sciences in the 70s. Uh, it is one department with two divisions, one division in electrical engineering one, one, and one in CS. It is very tightly in interconnected, and it has a mission. And maybe you have seen that. Uh, the very first uh, paragraph is very important in the context of this meeting. We do three things. We educate leaders, we create knowledge that refers to the research work that we do, and we serve the communities that we, that we reside in. Uh, the very first one is very important, and this program is all about leadership. It's all about engineering leadership, and we take it extremely seriously. <clears throat> the department is large. It's spread in primarily three buildings. There is the electrical engineering building, Corey Hall, the computer science building, Soda Hall, and Sutaj Zadai, the building that you're here today, does not belong in our, to our department, but you have tremendous presence in it. I would like to point, uh, if I find the pointer, here it is that this is the building that we are in right now. This part of the building is a clean room. Our department had a clean room for about 40 years, and this is the new one that we started about two years ago. And it was inaugurated uh, actually uh, a little bit over three years ago. The reason I have this slide in there is not because I expect most of you to be interested in, in semiconductor technology. I know that few of them, few of you might be directly interested in that. It's a little bit on the history of the department. Uh, this building is named after EECS graduates, Sutarja uh, and Dai. And it is named because they were extremely successful in starting a company to commercialize their research. We do that quite a bit. We have very strong industrial collaborations. Many of our alumni go on to do great things. And I hope that one day, maybe you will come back to do something like this for us as well. All right. <clears throat> A few more things about the department. Um, it's a large department. It's the largest on campus by a small margin, but still nevertheless large one, about 85 faculty. We have, in addition, about another 50 faculty uh, that are not ladder faculty, active emeriti, professors in residence, and so on. We have a very large research program, 530 graduate students, PhD and MS. We have a relatively small Masters of Engineering program. We started it a year ago, OK? And we pay quite a bit of attention to it. Uh, we have uh, a relatively large undergraduate program. I have to tell you that when it comes to these three communities, we are extremely selective. In every one of them, we, we admit less than 10% of the applicants. And uh, so we pay quite a bit of attention to quality. So uh, I, would like to, I would like you to know that you have been selected very carefully to be here today. Our faculty is extremely distinguished. I could list the awards and everything else and the statistics. I would like to, to point one fact that I would like to elaborate on. Sure, we do good research, but almost all of us, um, myself included uh, uh, and many others, have been involved in the entrepreneurship. In entrepreneurship, we have started companies, some of them quite successful. So we, uh, and we have students, graduate students and in the original group, masters and uh, PhD, that has spent quite a bit of attention to that one as well. We have contributed a lot. This is a long list. I would like to, since you're talking about case studies, I would like to uh, spend a few minutes on this slide. Uh, okay, what does this slide show? Uh, first of all, it didn't come from us. It came from a, study, uh, from a study outside the university. And it shows the transition from university work to billion dollar companies. So the red line is research. The blue line or gray line is in the industrial R&D. And the green line is a billion dollar industry. Now the red arrow points to marks with uh, our department actually initiated, played a big role in initiated those, interesting, those industries. VLSI design, electronic design automation, uh, risk processors, uh, client server computing, and so on and so forth. Now if you see here, the timeline is extremely long. It takes maybe 15 to 20 years to go from a neat idea at a university to a billion dollar industry. Uh, but we do it. Uh, we have done uh, more than any other university in this country, actually more than MIT and Stanford, perhaps combined when it comes to this. 
but what we try to do now, we try to accelerate it. The reason for this program, the reason you're here is because you really try to accelerate this. And I'll give you a case study. <clears throat> this is not a capstone project. It would have been a great capstone project 40 years ago. Okay? I'll let you imagine today's capstone project. 40 years ago, when people designed electronic circuits, the only way they had to test their ideas is to actually prototype them. Put them on the bench, uh, hook up wires on a, on a protoboard, and hook them to a scope to see if they work. So uh, some people in this department decided that maybe, maybe we can use these new things called computers and, uh, and uh, put some software in place, you know, this thing called software, and put it in place and simulate how integrated circuits work instead of prototyping them. That became SPICE. And that was, of course, a huge success. But what was very successful about this is not only the technology that they invented, but the way they decided to transfer this technology to the industry. And guess what they did? They did not start a company. They gave it away. And by giving it away, they essentially, in, a, in what you would call today an open source mode, they spawned an industry. And the industry is a multi-billion dollar industry today. Uh, about a year ago, Corey Hall received the physical plug as being the birthplace of SPICE, of the integrated circuit design revolution. And this particular, let's call it capstone project, taught us two things. Yes, it's great to have an innovative idea, but it's also great to find an innovative way to pass this idea to the community. Uh, by giving it away, the faculty and students involved in this did extremely well for themselves. They ended up being participating in many startups, many very successful startups. But most importantly, they created an industry instead of creating a company. That's something to keep in mind. Well, uh, I have to tell you that the department is fairly well recognized by the community, by the academic community. We are in three-way ties with uh, our friends at uh, both coasts. Uh, and we do extremely well in many, in many aspects, very well recognized for, for the work that we do. But I would like to, to tell you that I'm very proud of this. Uh, this department receives quite a bit of money for research and development and transfer of technology to industry and so on. About 45% of our funding comes from industry. That's a very, very large percentage. Uh, it is, it is, uh, as I, I would say it is maybe three or four times as much as the rest of the campus. So it's, it's a huge percentage. And uh, it's not surprising because many of the companies that you see here had very deep links with the department going back years, years ago. And many new companies are being started every day. So because of that, I think that when you do come here and you do go your capstone, you will be in very good position to capitalize on these relationships. Uh, a few more words about the department. Uh, it is uh, comprised of two divisions, electrical engineering and computer science. They are very tightly coupled. Uh, we have uh, many areas of study that you see here. Some of them, of course, are very clearly defined as electrical engineering. Others are in the fuzzy area in between, and so on. There's a continuum, as you can see. And uh, when we decided to start this new program, of course, we adopted the scheme that you have seen before, yesterday and today, and of course, in other literature, the T scheme with the, with the leadership courses and the capstone and the technical depth. But you're also expanding it, even though it is small. We're expanding it across the department. The, the faculty are really buying into this. When we started it a year ago, we had these three concentrations, physical electronics, robotics and embedded systems, visual computing and computer graphics. <clears throat> this year, we expanded physical electronics to include integrated circuits, not just devices. Uh, we, of course, we continue the ones that we have. We added signal processing and communications as an area of concentration. And there has been very serious talks that I think that are in development now to add, uh, to add uh, essentially uh, big data or data analytics and to add computing security as well. So as you can see, this thing is expanding while they try to be very, very selective and very careful on how you grow this. So where do you go from here? Well, once you come here, we would like your ideas. There are many challenges that uh, a department like this would cover. Uh, and these are the challenges that you see in the horizon. Information technology will have to keep improving we have to keep improving the density, the cost, the power dissipation, as Professor Donfer mentioned. Energy storage. If we want to make a difference in the energy equation, we have, to, we have to take advantage of renewables. Renewables do not operate on schedule. So energy storage is extremely important. <clears throat> 
you know, uh, we are very impressed with the new gadgets that we have, the iPads and the iPhones and so on. But if you follow the trends, what is happening is that intelligence, 50 years ago, started in big computer rooms, and now it is down in our palms and even smaller. Where would it go? That, that's a direction that we can play it all together. Health and well-being, of course. Energy efficiency. Bandwidth in communications. And uh, addressing the developing world, right? The $1 smart sensor, the $10 smartphone, the $100 per telepresent, or perhaps the $1,000 microgrid. These are inventions that the society needs. And I, I hope that you can come here and help us with those. So I think with that, I think I would like to stop. I have some pretty pictures. This is how uh, electrical engineering looked like sometime, not, not too long ago. In fact, I have to admit that uh, when I was a graduate student, I had a terminal that looked like this. But uh, my light bulbs did not look like that. I'm not that old. Okay. Things have changed. LEDs, renewable energy, really smart cars. And uh, we're not done yet. So we hope that you can make the right decision. We hope, hope that you can join us so you can get there. So with that, I would like to stop. And I would like to turn it over to Beth. Thanks. Set up here. And there we are. Perfect. Right back where we belong. All right, so this is Professor Per Peterson, and he is the chair of the Nuclear Engineering Department. Good. I'm going to give a quick introduction to the Department of Nuclear Engineering and the types of design projects that we've put together for <laughs> our Master of Engineering program students. And I'm going to describe some of the work that's going on this year to give you some flavor as to, to what it is that we do. Just as a, a quick introduction, uh, everybody knows the periodic table. And uh, the, the bottom part of the periodic table, actually, a lot of credit goes to this university. If you think about it, Glenn Seaborg uh, was looking at uranium as being the heaviest element, and then uh, they were making new elements using something called a cyclotron, which is a s accelerator invented by Ernest Lawrence, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Lawrence Livermore Lab. And uh, following uranium, of course, you know we have neptunium and plutonium are the next elements. Having run out of, of uh, planets at that point, he then moved on to americium after America, Berkeley, M, Californium, and so on. That's pretty much the beginning of what's been a, a long history of world-class research and leadership in the whole area of nuclear technology. So I think you're getting a flavor that all of the departments here in the College of Engineering are world-class, uh, 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 very strong. So what I'd like to do is to describe a little bit some of the work that we do in our MN project uh, in nuclear engineering. We're, we're very much interested in doing research which is relevant to the real world. And when we think about things such as nuclear security, medical imaging, or in this case, we're looking at a project this year that related to nuclear energy, uh, the question of how to do work that actually can impact the real world is one of the things that we focus on. And the faculty and students in the department have been tremendously influential in affecting things such as the design of passive safety systems, which are now being actually constructed in four reactors that are just entering into construction in the southeast. Radical change from previous approach to nuclear reactor safety, and so on. So what we like to do in our projects is to tie them to a realistic situation. And a part of that is by working with actual sites. Uh, so that you have detailed information about the site where you might be uh, locating a nuclear facility. 
The technology that the students have been working on this year is quite interesting. We've determined that we can take high temperature fuels that have been developed over the last couple of decades that are radically different in terms of how robust they are compared to the kinds of fuels that are used in today's reactors. And we can deliver heat at a significantly higher temperature than was possible before while having a high level of safety. And in fact, what you can see here is uh, uh, a system where we're now delivering heat in the range of, of 600 to 700 degrees centigrade. And you can take a off-the-shelf, pretty much off-the-shelf, natural gas-fired power plant, and by reconfiguring the turbines in this design that the students have put together to have multiple reheat stages, we can actually use an open air cycle to uh, uh, generate electricity. And in this configuration, now, today's nuclear plants have about 32% efficiency. A combustion turbine would have about 60% efficiency in this configuration. The nuclear version here is interesting because we can actually boost the efficiency up to 45%, which means you're getting almost 50% more power out of the same plant. But also, it's quite different because we're no longer looking like a conventional baseload plant. Uh, by this sort of configuration, you have the capability to do natural gas co-firing, so you can boost your power output by another 50%. This is interesting because the net efficiency for converting this natural gas for peaking power into electricity comes in at about 67%, which means that these plants, in principle, uh, uh, should be able to do all of the electrical grid services that you'd like to have, baseload, black start, peaking power with very high efficiency converting gas into electricity, uh, ability to accommodate uh, grid disturbances, provide spinning reserve, so a whole series of things, and also process heat. This could be transformational, and it makes it something that's interesting to work on. This is pretty much characteristic of the types of projects that we try to put together for the MNG program. And the key goals then are, first of all, to have some, to, to, to develop an understanding of how one organizes large scale infrastructure projects, where you're going to end up having teams of hundreds to thousands of people engaged in the process of trying to develop these new technologies. The second element is that we want to teach students about how energy systems work and how one designs nuclear systems and associated technologies to get them to work as an integrated system. And this means not just reactors, but also how one do, might do recycle, uh, fuel production, waste disposal. And then we'd like to see how do you integrate that into the bigger picture of all of the other energy sources that we'd like to have. We work on the question of how do we finance these types of large-scale infrastructure projects and how can we improve this through things such as moving towards smaller modular reactor technologies. And then finally, all of our energy system actually works within a relatively complex web of regulation and having some background about how it is that we actually organize and regulate energy markets and energy infrastructure is one of the more important things to have available if you're going to understand how we can transform future energy systems. And so in this case, uh, for, we, we look at the nuclear-specific elements, such as how do we license reactors, both from the perspective of the reactors and the sites, what are the considerations in terms of the international market? And then, more broadly, how does this fit into the larger overall regulatory framework that we have for uh, uh, energy systems, environmental impact statements, and other things of that nature? And so I think that one of the key things that we try to do here is to make sure that in addition to working on technical dimensions of problems, we place them into the broader context of how our society regulates energy, how it is that markets function, how it is that you organize and execute large-scale projects, which is a really vital element of actually translating research innovation into uh, uh, actual change in the world. And I think the university has done a good job of that uh, if you take a look at the history 
And what we want to do is to remain relevant and continue making changes with these sorts of projects being another example of how you can do that. So at any rate, uh, I hope to see many of you here in the fall. Take care. Thanks. All right, good morning, everyone. So my job is to describe the material science and engineering department and uh, drop a few ideas for you about capstone projects. So let me begin by welcoming all of you. I understand this is visit day for the Master of Engineering program. If you walk into our building, the marquee over the door says mining and metallurgy. The reason is because it used to say that. This is the same building back in 1920. It was the second building put up on the Berkeley campus. The Hearst Memorial Mining Building. George Hearst himself was a miner. In fact, at one point in time, he owned the three largest mines in the world. Kennecott Copper uh, was a derivative, the Homestake Mining Company, and the Comstock Load. So copper, silver, and gold. He had them all, uh, typical of uh, Berkeley folks. Uh, so we have a building named after him because of his son, because the father, George, won the San Francisco Examiner newspaper in a card game, gave it to the son to see what he could do with it. And of course, at one point in time, 25% of all people in the country were reading Hearst publication papers. So the department began as a college. It was the College of Mining, as you can see, eventually merging into what we are now today, the Material Science and Engineering Department. And if you ask what material science and engineers do, they do this, this little metaphorical logo picture of understanding the structure of materials understanding how the processing of those materials affects structure and properties. Oh, let me use my laser pointer here, so properties here. And then how all of this affects performance. And I put this at the apex of this tetrahedron because that's really what engineers are about. So as you're thinking of capstone projects, the idea is to imagine how might I engage with performance in engineering materials where that materials issue is the underlying theme of the investigation. So can I give you a quick example? This is a cutaway of the Tesla. What runs is the little item in the back. It's an electric motor. If you wanted to build one of those electric motors, you would have to find some magnets. You could go to China, the Ningbo Hilan factory, and you can purchase magnet components in this sort of configuration. Now you're a practicing engineer. You want to build a better motor you want to possibly get some better magnets. So what happens in this case? Why, for instance, that they choose an iron neodymium boron, which, by the way, was invented back around the early 80s. Uh, General Motors had a large part of that, and that was a Berkeley grad. One of my classmates, when we were graduate students together, developed the iron neodymium boron hard permanent magnet. So how would you get these shapes? Well, one option is what's called shape casting. Materials engineers know this very well, but they also know that it's very, very fussy. I've got risers, I've got gates, I've got sprues, I've got runners. I've got a lot of material that has to be recast. And, re and by the way, the properties are terrible because it's dendritic. So what about hot working? What if I took a poor ingot of this material and started beating it into shape? Well, yeah, we could do that too, but that's very costly, high energy. And by the way, what happens to a magnet when you place it at higher temperatures, above the Curie temperature, it loses its magnetization. Can I retain it back at low temperatures? Maybe, maybe not. And what about the oxidation products that form when I try to do this heat treatment at high temperatures? Are you getting the theme here, folks? Uh, this is material. These are materials issues. You want to build a better magnet, you're thinking through options, and you're striking out. Well, we could always take a big chunk of this stuff and machine away what we don't like. Oh, well, terrible waste tribology effects, surface damage, what am I going to do with the um, byproduct if I don't machine the cavity the appropriate way? Uh, doesn't quite work, uh, makes for a lot of more serious concerns. So there's a few op there are a few options left, but the one that Ning Bao Hilan chose is called powder metallurgical processing. They begin with a powder, they put it into a press, they squeeze it, and they heat it up, not to red heat, but just enough heat to allow for what we call solid state diffusion to occur, and they produce a sintered product. And this is how they make their magnets. Now, why bother with all of this? 
Well, it turns out that if you really want a magnet, you will choose iron neodymium boron. You've got remnant magnetization, the highest values here. This is basically the primary metric of strength of a magnet. What's called the BH product, this is, has something to do with the energy of the magnet, highest again. And the Curie temperature is where uh, there's a little bit of concern because if it gets above the Curie temperature, it loses its magnetic properties. But still, 310 to 400 Celsius is kind of difficult to achieve. Um, I mean, unless you're going to take one of these Teslas out to drift with it or something like that, which I doubt people would do. But there, there's a possibility you could reach high enough temperatures to drive the magnets. And what makes all of it work, you can see Alnico, which was the original magnet, aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. This is what most folks know as magnets. This is what you uh, might have heard your parents grow up with. Samarium cobalt came in when the Sony Walkman appeared. Remember that? <laughs> Uh, and people would wear headphones, and those little magnets in the headphones were samarium cobalt. And today we have iron neodymium boron. But those constituents are an issue. It turns out that if you list a lot of these rare earths, you find out that they are called strategic. U.S. calls them strategic elements. The dysprosium, presidinium, neodymium, this is the one that's in the iron neodymium boron magnet which is used for, as you can see, wind turbines, vehicles, even batteries. And so, is there an issue here? Well, yeah, it's called strategic for a reason. It's because of what China did last summer and said, ah, we're not going to ship any more rare earths out of China. They're ours. We've cornered the market. Obama administration went ballistic. But, 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 but we're trying to get all of these people to go to electric vehicles in this country. What are we going to do without these magnets? Folks, capstone project. Caps, <laughs> capstone project. Come on, we have to find alternatives. We've got to find better ways of either making these magnets more efficient or new materials engineering. So just plant that idea as one candidate for you and tell you a little bit about us. We are a relatively small department by comparison to electrical engineering, on the order more of nuclear engineering. 17 full-time faculty, only about three part-time. Our emeriti outnumber <laughs> most of our faculty, although most of them are still around, and you'll see them walking the halls. We have an adjunct member of the faculty who happens to be head of the material science division at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And the affiliate, affiliated faculty include the head of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Professor Alavisatos. The chancellor of the Berkeley campus, Professor Robert Bergenau, um, and Professors Hellman from physics, Banfield from earth and planetary sciences, and Peidong Gang from chemistry. So we run the gamut because of the interdisciplinary nature of material science and engineering. These are our regulars, and those are the ones that you'll see most often around the campus. As for capstone projects, the expertise in this department is, again, broad and diverse. We uh, all have some aspect of structural materials, those that bear load, functional materials, those that are used in specific applications like piezoelectrics, ferroelectrics, ferroic materials, many materials that have functional qualities other than bearing load. And as you can see, we do processing, property measurements, characterization, and we work in all of them, metals, ceramics, semiconductors, polymers, and composites. We have an outstanding group of students, currently 88 or so uh, at the undergraduate level, 55 who are joint major, joint with, say, materials in nuclear, materials in electrical, materials in chemical, materials in mechanical, which happens to be the most popular, and others. And about 100 some graduate students in the department. Uh, always looking for good times to party as well. <laughs> so, so our rankings, as you heard, we all do quite well. And of course, we can always choose the ones that we like. This is the one I like the best. Uh, this uh, QS World University, you see where Berkeley is. And this is, by the way, this is metallurgy and materials, right? So you can see by these scores, we're pretty darn close to uh, MIT. And, and what I particularly like about this is how far away this <laughs> other inst institution is. So that's why this one is one of the reasons this is my favorite. So let me finish by saying welcome to all of you, and I uh, look forward to talking to you about some of these projects. Thank you.
So welcome, I'll add my welcome. Many of you I met uh, yesterday evening, but for those I didn't and, and for those I did, it's, it's great to see you again. Um, in the next few minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about our, our specific IUR MEng program because I think it's a little bit different than all of the others. We, we for example, don't know how to advance. <laughs> Apparently, what's the point of having a remote where you have to actually, <laughs> anyway. So you can see I like to walk, but it's clear I'm not going to do this with it. So, so here are essentially three bullet points that, that, that say exactly the same thing um, um, because, because I want to make, the, I really want to make this point. What we're trying to do in our MEng program, maybe as distinct from the others, is to specifically train you in quantitative decision making. So the focus is not so much on a particular application domain or, or a particular uh, um, set of uses of this decision making, but it's really uh, um, providing you with a set of tools and a set of approaches and a way of thinking about problems um, that lets you make your quantitative analysis, lets you think about how to model problems and what kind of problems, problems involving people, equipment, materials, information, energy. Right, so, so all the stuff in the world, um, and in particularly systems of these things, and, and to think about how you design these systems, how you implement these systems, how you operate these kinds of systems, and how you make better decisions to do so. Right, so this is, this is, in general, what, what industrial engineering and operations research is about. Um, from a research pers perspective, um, all of the faculty in the department work on developing these kinds of tools. And, and the focus in, in our MEng program is to train you in how to use these, these kinds of tools. Um, so you can say the same thing. Creatively use quantitative modeling and analysis tools to, to solve a broad array of, of decision problems. So again, it, it's in, maybe in contrast in some, to some of the other programs where the focus is on the specific technology, here the focus is on really understanding how to make uh, um, better decisions and with a, um, particular interest in, in complementing the, the top of the T courses. So, so many of the kinds of issues that, that you would consider in the top of the T courses in the MEng, really in, in our um, technical courses, we focus on more sophisticated tools for making analytical decisions. And the way we do that is, is uh, um, also, in, in contrast to some of the other departments, we have two, two, two core courses that all of the students in our program are, are required to take. Um, you know, unless you have a particularly strong background in these areas and you can place out, but, but the design of our, our program is that there are two core courses, the two technical electives in the fall semester, all of our students are required to take. Um, and it's these courses, I think, that give you the sort of the heart of your technical education. So the first one is a, a course we call Optimization Analytics, which is really built around the fact that all those things we used to just talk about 20 years ago, all the kinds of analysis, all the kinds of, 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 of uh, modeling that we used to just talk about, now you can do very effectively and very quickly on your desktop. Um, and so that's what this course is about. It's about teaching you how to use those tools, the optimization tools, to model and solve real world problems. How, how data affects your solutions, how your solutions are sensitive to certain parameters and not other parameters, how, what are the risks associated with, out, with outcomes. So I would say 85% of this course is really how to use these kinds of tools at a fairly sophisticated level to make business and system decisions. And um, sort of 15% is an introduction to the mathematics behind, the, behind these tools. But again, the focus is on, on the use of these tools. And then the other, the other core course, I know, for some reason I like to have a lecture on the other side. It's, no, it's, it's, I think there's only one more or two more after this, so it's okay. The other core course is a course around risk modeling, simulation, and, and analysis, right? If the first course is really about um, um, finding the best solutions to complicated optimization questions, and um, red's a little hard to see, but it's not so important. The, this course is really about using tools like simulation, advanced statistical techniques, stochastic analysis, Monte Carlo simulation. This is kind of the, the, the counterpart to the, to the previous course that really focuses on managing risk 
on modeling uncertainty in these systems. And again, with a big focus on um, commercial software tools and using these commercial software tools to make kinds of decisions. And so after the first semester, um, all of our students, all of our MN students really have this fundamental understanding of how to use these kinds of tools to make, to make business decisions. And then the second, <laughs> the second semester is, is really around um, applying these tools, right? And so we have a set of application courses in kind of broadly speaking operations, logistics, manufacturing, supply chain kinds of issues, a set of more advanced courses around modeling and decision analytics that build on the, on the tools you learn the first year and maybe focus more on the theory behind those, the first semester rather than focus on the theory behind those tools. We have several courses that focus on applications of these tools to uh, um, risk systems analysis or to, to financial systems analysis. We have some courses that focus on applying these tools to energy market analysis. But really sort of our, our, our departmental philosophy is that although these, these application courses will give you depth in a particular area and teach you some more sort of tricks of the trade in these areas, really after the courses in the first, sem first semester, you're really qualified to in some sense teach yourself about all of these areas, to really go into the workforce and use the kinds of tools um, that we teach you to make an impact in, in, any of, in all of these areas and, and, and also in others. And I think that's reflected in, so, so this is just a list of those courses which you can find on, on the website. This is just, uh, um, you know, database courses, productions courses, financial engineering courses, more advanced statistics courses, production planning courses, uh, um, and then more sort of technical courses, stochastic processes, dynamic programming, and so forth that, that focus on extending the, the technical basis. Um, but I think more interesting is, is the capstone projects, because really I think the capstone projects are, are where the rubber hits the road. That's where you really get an opportunity to take the tools you learn, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the first semester, and, and really apply them. So these are, these are um, the projects, either the first sort of three quarters of projects that students did this year, and the last quarter are projects that um, we didn't find takers for. I, I don't know if you've gone over the process of... of, of uh, okay, so, so, so there were many more projects than, 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 than students last year, and so um, the first set um, around lead time reduction, cycle time analysis, forecasting and capacity planning, these are two projects that I worked on at, at SanDisk, um, carbon neutral, neutral wholesale power procurement initiative. So UCOP is the University of California Office of the President, the, the entity that, that um, uh, lords over the entire UC system. And uh, um, they're changing the way they procure, pr procure power for the whole University of California system. And one of our, one of our capstone groups was highly involved in that. Then there are lots of sort of internet applications, big data applications, uh, um, Variety of, uh, variety of of projects, but almost, I would say, 80% or even higher of our students actually are doing these projects currently with, with companies. They're visiting these companies on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, certainly, the two projects I run with, with SanDisk, students in, in both groups have received job offers from SanDisk as a result of, of the, the capstone projects. So, so really, we see our, our courses as training you to make an effective impact on, on, on these kinds of companies and address, address these kinds of problems. So I'm going to stop there. I will be around uh, at lunch if you, have, if you have more questions for me. But again, hopefully uh, I'll see you guys in the fall. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Professor Kaminsky. All right, I'm going to get it. Professor Mananat has a presentation as well. I'm going to pull up here. And Professor Mananat is with the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Thank you. 
So I do realize I'm the only thing standing between you and your lunch. But I must say they're still setting up for lunch, so we've been told lunch is at 12.15, so take your time. Oh, well then. <laughs> I'll shift to the long version of that presentation. No. I, uh, one of the things I don't have to do is to tell you what a wonderful place Berkeley is or what a fantastic university UC Berkeley is. Uh, you've heard from my colleagues already ad nauseum about this. I will say, however, I will summarize this by saying that this is the best place to live in the United States and this is the best all-round university in the United States. You're surrounded by excellence wherever you look. Uh, I want to say a few things about my department, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, we are, have been ranked number one uh, in civil engineering and in environmental engineering every year for the past seven or eight years. I can't keep track of that by uh, US News and World Report. We were also ranked as number one doctoral program uh, in civil engineering uh, by the National Research Council. Uh, however, we are new to the MNG uh, game. This is the first year that we're admitting an MNG class. Um, it took us a bit longer to uh, get together and uh, design two thrusts. And we've done that uh, in um, starting small with basically two, as I said, two thrusts focusing on cyber physical systems and intelligent transportation systems. And what is common in both of these thrusts is, the, is that we're bringing together the latest and best of information technology to bear on civil engineering problems. So the first of these thrusts is very general. It includes a whole range of application areas where we bring in technologies such as sensors, um, communication, etc. Uh, to bear on problems in energy, in um, uh, large-scale infrastructure such as water um, and buildings and uh, various other civil infrastructure systems. Uh, under this thrust, uh, there are, uh, these are some of the examples of the courses that you might be taking. Uh, there, these are the, for the technical courses that you'd be taking. Obviously, the, the other courses, such as the top of the T and the, the capstone project, um, uh, are not listed here. Um, the second of these thrusts is uh, focused on intelligent transportation systems, and this is an area of great interest in the field of transportation. For the past 10 years or so, uh, the the way that we operate highways, airports, the way we control traffic, the way that we uh, control public transportation systems uh, has changed. And it's changed as a result of bringing more and more information technology results into the uh, management and control of such systems. So this thrust will prepare you to basically combine knowledge in transportation systems and transportation operations with the latest in information technology so that you can provide better management of your transportation systems. A few examples of these courses are listed here. Uh, two of these courses, I should say, in this trust are required. These are um, uh, the first two listed here. One focuses on transportation operations, teaches you basically the physics of transportation systems. How, does bottle, how do bottlenecks form? How does congestion um, uh, build up? And how do, how do we measure all of these things? The second one is focused on systems analysis and where we we'll provide you with a more global view of transportation uh, with an emphasis clearly on uh, decision making for managing transportation systems. Um, and then the other courses build on these two courses uh, focusing on one or other mode of transportation. Now to give you a short idea about the kind of research that we do and that is spawning some of the capstone projects that uh, you will be seeing this year, the first one uh, known as Mobile Millennium is exactly at that intersection of um, communication and sensing and transportation, so where the idea of using smartphones at traffic sensors, this is my colleague Alex Bein who's leading this uh, large research project. Some of you might have heard over the weekend 
that the National Science Foundation awarded uh, Berkeley a 10 million grant for doing research on big data. And one of the components of this big data initiative is in fact this mobile millennium uh, research project. Um, this gives you an idea of a timeline of it. The idea basically is that because we all use smartphones nowadays, they're GPS equipped, and as a result, uh, if you agree to participate in this program, your uh, information as you travel from one point of the freeway system or local arterial street system to another uh, is, can be coded and uh, your um, personal information is not revealed, but the travel time it takes you to travel from one, one point, say, to another is measured and aggregated with that of other people and this way we can provide information back to travelers about congestion and about shortest routes from between various origins and various destinations. So that's one example of research and projects that you might be involved in. Another one, also uh, kind of looking here as using smartphones, not so much to collect data, but rather to try to influence your behavior. This is my colleague, John Walker. Uh, also part of that um, big data project. Again, the, in the intersection between technology and transportation here. The idea is that by you might be able to provide personalized feedback regarding the carbon footprint of people's route and mode choice decisions, health benefits, time, and money associated with their decisions. So one of the things we try to do um, in, is to convince people to shift gradually to use public transportation. Not, not always a very good option in the United States, but for some of this research, which is done in China, uh, there are um, uh, public transportation systems are more developed and uh, the cities are denser. So you might be able to provide people uh, enough information to incentivize them to make behavioral changes away from to being stuck in congestion and contributing to um, smog, to uh, modes of transportation such as biking or using public transportation systems. And, and there's a, that whole use of persuasive technology uh, is, is something new. Uh, there's a, there is a capstone design project that's in the works that actually is being developed still uh, on specifically using this. It was tested this is being tested here on the Berkeley campus uh, with a group of students and we, we were interested in doing a larger scale project associated with that. So that's that for civil and environmental engineering and I'll, I'll be at lunch and look forward to talking to you more about all of that. Thank you. for a few minutes. So what I would like to do is um, use this time to talk a little bit about capstone projects because you'll notice in the afternoon we have no specific section set aside for capstone projects because the faculty have all been hinting at it and you have a great handout I want to point out in your packet, the blue handout, which tells you about the process of selecting capstones. It gives you the list of capstones that were um, run this year and then it also gives you a little teaser of some of the capstones that have already started to come in that Cindy has um, received from faculty and industry um, for this year. And that's just a tip of the iceberg uh, because we expect to have a full list due this summer. Um, and there are usually typically a couple rounds, but we want you guys to, to match with a project that both um, is a good fit for your skills and is also a good fit for your um, concentration that you're studying in um, and is, is a project that you want to do. So we want to have you know, more proposals than we have teams of, of people. And um, we do, want, we do we want each project to have a team of three to five. Um, we, our idea is you're going to have one round of voting in the summer um, so that we call down the project proposals to a smaller amount. Um, and then when you come here on campus, you can talk to faculty during office hours. Um, you know, you can, we'll have industry um, sponsors here during office hours, doing presentations during that first week of school and during orientation, you can really find out what your top first, second, third choice capstone project
for other students that are interested in doing your project with, with you in order for it to run. You can certainly propose it to the full groups, but, but that's really you know, the, the gist of it, and, and working with the faculty advisors to make sure that it really is a capstone project that is five units and, and nine months worth of work, not too, too much, too little. Um, but um, given that, I also want to point out you have another handout, which has um, your all of each department um, has, with their requirements. So it starts out um, with the requirements that everyone has at the top of the CUNY um, leadership classes, and then it continues on with your requirements for um, each individual department, which we heard a little bit about from the department chairs as well. Um, so I also want to, I think you, some of you met him last night, but David Messerschmidt, Professor David Messerschmidt, Emeritus, as well as here, if you want to come up um, and join us. He is one of our capstone um, advisors for really the capstone integration materials. So his role is working with uh, Professor Lee Fleming in taking what you're doing with your capstone and helping you um, do all these um, mid-progress deliverables. So those are on your sheet too. So we do presentations, everything from your problem statement to um, a go-to-market plan to anything about IP, if that's relevant, um, and a lot of um, project management presentations you're giving to um, Professor Meshmet or Professor Fleming. So if you wanted to <laughs> say a few words, or we could also just take questions. I might just take a, make a couple more points right. to add what you said. Uh, you, all you've, all of you've heard presentations from the departments in the college. Um, capstone projects don't necessarily align completely with a department, the interest of a department. Uh, many times when you're addressing a problem in the real world, uh, there isn't a single discipline or a single sub-discipline that can really address that effectively. Uh, so you're very much encouraged to bring people into your team who are coming from perhaps a different department from the core where the, where the project was defined. If they bring skills and knowledge, which would be particularly germane uh, to what the problem that you're, or the challenge you're addressing, uh, secondly, project groups uh, really have three focuses. They have three masters, if you will. One is they have an academic advisor who's a regular engineering professor. Uh, secondly, they are reviewed weekly or bi-weekly, uh, meet with people from the leadership side, and I'm one of those people that the projects have been meeting with this year, from the leadership side to uh, talk about the business issues, the uh, intellectual property issues, the uh, project management, teamwork issues, and the presentation issues, and also to give all of the students a lot more opportunity to practice their presentation, uh, oral presentation skills, which are very important in the real world, and to get uh, constructive feedback on all of those things. And the third focus of the group is end users, or people who are adopters or customers of whatever you're uh, trying to accomplish who can inform you about what the real world issues are that you have to address and then can re review your ideas and critique your ideas. Oftentimes that's people in industry, as was mentioned, but it may not necessarily be people in industry. Uh, in some cases it's, it's actually uh, real end users, uh, members of the public who may be using a health uh, initiative that you're addressing, uh, you know, eventual real end users, not just people trying to commercialize this. So uh, the project groups are encouraged to be in touch with people like that as well. So there really are three focus for each uh, project group. Any questions about projects, uh, capstone projects? Um, I really am the only thing that's standing between you and <laughs> lunch. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to address. I think people are hungry. OK, well, um, yeah, like I said, they, well, they should be, be done by now if you guys want to make your way um, down back to the Blum Plaza level for lunch. And um, I'll, I'll be at lunch in case. Yes, yes, yeah. So, yeah the, um, a lot of the, the faculty chairs that work here and David and Cindy and I will all be at lunch to answer your questions. A um, couple things I wanted to point out. So you're going to go, again, just to remind you, you're going to go straight from lunch to campus tours. Um, and you'll go on a great campus tour um, around the whole campus. And I want you guys, um, we're going to start promptly at 3 p.m. back in this room. So uh, your tour should um, come back by 2.45 so you can um, get yourself settled in. And we'll start promptly at, at 3 o'clock with the all-important student life and career services panel. So that'll be a great way for you to learn more about the career services. Um, and Julie McShane.
teaching, and we have three students representing three different departments um, to talk about housing and um, you know settling in at Berkeley and their capstone projects, their um, experiences here, um, finding jobs, um, balancing work and life um, and studying. So um, have a great lunch, have a great tour, and we'll, we'll be starting again right here at probably 3 o'clock. So thanks, guys. Thank you very much.